Okay, hello. I am Cynthia Hipwell. I am professor and director of the Invent Lab at Texas A&M University and a member of the program committee. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Anderson, who's going to be speaking about the relevance of NAE to innovation. Um, in his role at NAE, Dr. Anderson is, is, in addition to his role at NAE, Dr. Anderson is currently a distinguished professor of chemical engineering at Illinois Tech's Armour College of Engineering, a fellow of the Amer American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was a presidential appointment to the National Science Board in 2014 for a six-year term and has received numerous awards, including the Andreas Akravos Professional Progress Award from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and the National Engineering Award from the American Association of Engineering Societies. At the National Academy of Engineering, Dr. Anderson will continue to focus on helping to bring more women and underrepresented minorities into the f engineering field with initiatives such as the Grand Challenges Scholars Program, Engineer Girl, and Frontiers of Engineering. After Dr. Anderson has concluded his presentation, we will have five minutes for questions so you can approach the microphones. Um, please welcome Dr. John Anderson. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, this is like an eye chart up here, trying to see everybody in the various corners. And I believe uh, uh, this is a ritual for all the presidents of the academies to come to Tamas now. Victor Zhao was here last year. I know Marsha McNutt was here a couple years ago. So it's a good indoctrination. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you. I want to commend the organization of TAMIS. I've really been, I've been here now uh, two days and I'm really impressed by what I see and I don't see this any, in any other state that I visited. So congratulations on a great uh, organization to advance uh, medicine, engineering, science and technology, higher education as well. Now I've been an, acad I've been an academic, put the slide up here. I've been an academic my total career but I've observed a lot of things, so I might not be the best person to talk about innovation in terms of having done it or practiced it, but I have observed some things. And uh, no one has asked me so far in my six months as president of National Academy of Engineering about the relevance of NAE to innovation. So it's a really good question. It's gotten me to think and maybe act, hopefully act on some uh, ideas of how NAE can be more proactive in uh, pushing the, the uh, topic of innovation throughout the country. So in my talk today, I'll s mention some things about the National Academy of Engineering, some statistics. Then I'm gonna talk about words, definitions, because I think they are important. Sometimes we use words without assuming everyone knows what they mean, but maybe we don't have concurrence in that. And finally, something about relevance. The mission of the National Academy of Engineering is to advance the well-being of the nation by first promoting a vibrant engineering profession and secondly marshalling the expertise and insights of eminent engineers to provide independent advice to the federal government. Now, uh, traditionally, the second mission uh, was thought to mean that the government comes to us to ask for advice for NAS, NA, NAE, and um, uh, NAM. But I think the three academies have adopted the posture now that we go to the government with advice, even if they don't ask for it, because they have to understand certain things uh, of importance. The NAE is a service organization, meaning that uh, you get inducted. It's a great honor to be inducted into one of the three national academies, but then it's work after that. So about the NAE, we're not a government organization, nor is the NES or NAM a government organization. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We have 35 staff, as does NAS and NAM. We have 2,300 members, all U.S. citizens, 270 international members. The first woman was elected in 1965. The first class was in 1964. 
Lillian Gilbreth was elected in 65. She is uh, one of the founders of the field of industrial engineering. And she's famous because two of her children, she had 12 children and two of them wrote the book Cheaper by the Dozen. In fact, it said that Lillian Galbraith, her husband died, unfortunately, when he was young, so she had to raise 12 kids and have an outstanding career as a single, as a single mom. But she used to do experiments in the house using time management and so on, and is just a fantastic person. And the NE has a lecture series called the Gilbreth Lecture Series, where the speakers uh, attend a meeting in February to present some results. The second woman was elected in 1973, so that means there were 300, of the first 375 members of NAE, 374 were men and one was a, and one was a woman. We're trying to change that. And so in the last four years, election years, 25% of our members have been uh, women. Same thing on underrepresented minorities. The first minority uh, was elected in 1977. And now, uh, in the last three years, 7% of our membership has been a uh, minority. Thirty-one percent of our members, and this is, I think, a really important statistic, which we should make sure our government understands. Thirty-one percent of our members were born outside the United States. For NAS is 26 percent. I'm not sure about NAM. So clearly, immigration has been very, very good to science, engineering, and uh, in technology. 58% of the active members, I say active, the, the, uh, of the members, participated in an NAE or NRC activity in 2018, which is quite good for a volunteer organization. And one of our goals is to, to up that number to two thirds if we can. 50% of our members are elected each year, have, have to have had business experience. And this makes us a little different than the other two academies. In fact, the NE was formed in 1964 under the charter of the NAS so that more business people would get in to the academies and serve on NRC committees. So there's a purpose in doing this. And in fact, in the first class, 1964, 25 members were inducted, 1964, uh, and 60% of those were from the business community. Our challenge in the National Academy of Engineering and elsewhere, I think, is to engage the business community. As you see here, you have a partnership with business and academe, and uh, we really need to work harder on that at the National Academy of Engineering. Now, the National Research Council is the operating arm, really, for the, all three academies. Uh, while each academy has a staff of only about 35 or 40 individuals, permanent staff, uh, the National Research Council has a permanent staff of almost 1,100 individuals, uh, mostly uh, people with advanced degrees, by the way. And uh, the, they do about $300 million of work per year, about 80% of which is funded by the, the federal government. Uh, the presidents of the three academies are chairs, and Marsha McNutt is the chair, and I and Victor are the vice chairs of the National Research Council. There are seven divisions, and we're now looking at the National Research Council in a strategic way to see if we're organized in the right way. And there's a, a planning going on that involves all three academies, and a strategic plan will be developed. The leader of that is Victor Zhao, the, the president of NAM. As I said, 80% of our funding comes from the US government. There's also a transformational study going on in the National Research Council to, to make more efficient uh, the processes that occur there, for instance, reducing time to uh, publication of a, of a consent report. There are two major, the, the NRC operates with these seven divisions and many boards under each division, uh, sort of like an autonomous body. We oversee it, but a lot of academy members serve on the, these panels, uh, but two major focus areas are emerging over the past year, less than a year, that the three presidents have decided on. One is addressing issues of climate change. Uh, what we're gonna do about it, how we adapt to it, uh, how we mitigate it, lessen its uh, 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 extrapolation. 
And the second one is health systems, looking at science, engineering, and medicine together and how we can all work together. Uh, you heard an excellent talk before me about uh, health systems and prevention, the idea of prevention. So these are two major areas. You'll see you hear more about those in the future. Now let me, let me talk about um, names, words. You know, I, uh, four years ago I gave a talk at uh, Arizona State University and I asked the NAE, what's the definition of engineering? And I couldn't get an answer. And it's kind of odd since we're the National Academy of Engineering. And uh, you look up various definitions. The one they gave me, which I like, but it's, it's incomplete, is von Karman, the great uh, father of aeronautics, who talks about engineering as creating what never was. Uh, I don't think this is a sufficient definition because uh, if you dig a ditch, you created something that wasn't. So uh, you have to ha go a little bit further than that. Another one that I found that I really dislike uh, is that, because uh, it's only a partial definition, is a system, uh, a system practice, systematic practice of design to achieve solutions to human problems. It doesn't talk about identifying problems. It doesn't talk about creativity. We, don't, we use now things we didn't think we needed before. So creativity is really important. And we call that an innovation is really important. So I don't like this one. Even the NASM, by the way, is the new name for NRC, if, it, if you haven't seen that before. National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. So we dug this one up, and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to bury it as soon as possible. <laughs> now a third one, in the, in the bridge, the bridge is a periodical, comes out quarterly from the National Academy of Engineering, and we started a president's column, so my first column was, what is engineering, what's the definition? And uh, one we've suggested is this one, but it's a, it's, it's a path along to get to the final result. So if you have ideas, and I've actually gotten some people to write in so far about their ideas of, of what is engineering and how we define engineering. Um, I'm trying to encourage Marcia McNutt and Victor Zal to do the same for their fields but they've been a little reluctant so far. Now, what is innovation? This is even a more difficult question. Uh, I've found 100 definitions of innovation. I know, I know what it's not. It's more than just a good idea, right? And I think in academic environments, uh, people who talk about innovation think it's just an idea. You have a good idea, that's innovation, but it has to be adopted, it has to change. It has to, it's more than solving a problem. It's also identifying a problem. It's more than just making money, although money is a parameter that could indicate the, the value of the innovation. It has to affects the way, it does affect the way we communicate, work, play, think, and our health as well. And it spurs R&D. So these are the ideas of, of what is innovation, and I'm not going to go further and even uh, try to uh, define it as such. Now innovation, of course, has uh, been uh, a topic of many, many um, studies, especially in economics, oddly enough. And there's an economist named uh, A.O. Hirschman and a wonderful article in The New Yorker by Malcolm Gladwell about her Hirschman. And this is a great quote, that creativity always comes as a surprise to us, therefore we can never count on it and we do not believe it, in it until it has happened. Hence, the only way in which we can bring our creative resources fully into play is by misjudging or underestimating the nature of the task and not acknowledging what creativity it will take to get there. And he gives some examples of projects that would have never been started if people knew the obstacles. But once they got to them, some creativity overcame those obstacles. I thought this is just an excellent idea, a uh, 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 sort of a capsule uh, sample of the importance of innovation that allows us to get by and to, uh, to actually improve a situation even when we thought it was gonna be easy and we run into an obstacle, it's difficult, the creativity comes to play. So a question is, how is NEE relevant? And this is the primary uh, to uh, uh, topic of the, of the talk. And 
people look at various measures of innovation, and I've just jotted down some ideas about how NEE can be relevant. One is we can get out of Washington and talk more to people around the country, which we're trying to do. We can highlight and recognize engineering accomplishments uh, that um, involved innovative, and not just engineering, science and medicine. I'm speaking as the president of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, and NSF, the engineering director of NSF, would like to do a study on major innovations that have been basically funded by the engineering directorate. Uh, and we will be partnering with them to do that. They talk about tracing, trace important patents and startups to, uh, from startups to financial support. And the NSF has actually started, the National Science Foundation has uh, started a project to look at important patents that derive from basic research, trying to trace them back to uh, studies that were funded by the National Science Foundation. It'd be interesting to expand that to the Department of Energy and other places to see how that, what the trail was to get to, uh, to a particular innovation. My, ba my, my basic feeling about innovation is that the, the most important thing is the climate for innovation. And too often, there's a tension between change and tradition. And that tension is something that has to be addressed. It's, uh, as a university president and as a dean of engineering, I had to address that almost on a daily basis of how we were going to move ahead but keep certain traditions. All right? Industry is a little bit better about uh, uh, dumping old traditions and moving on the change. But the climate has to be there and people have to be willing to, to, uh, to change. There's an old saying about change is, uh, change is good, you go first. And uh, a lot of people like to adopt that. But I actually think you should, uh, uh, that change is good, I go first. That would be a much better situation. Now, I think I was thinking about National Academy of Engineering and what we do that is relevant to uh, promoting uh, innovation. We don't innovate in the academies. We empower, we convene people, uh, uh, but we don't innovate. But how can we promote the concept and the, the practice of innovation, be very supportive of it, in other words? And I've listed um, four things here on my next slide. These are programs we have at the NAE to promote innovation. The first is the Frontiers of Engineering. I think just a fantastic program. And by the way, the protege program you have here is somewhat related to this and actually could maybe expand a bit to, to be a Texas Frontiers of Engineering and Science, let's say. Uh, this was, the Frontiers of Engineering was established in 1995 as, an, as a parallel organization to the frontiers of science, which still exists from the NAS. And we seek industrial support for this. Now, this is a group of people, you're looking here at a, the United States Frontiers of Engineering 2019 conference at the Boeing Dreamliner factory in uh, uh, South Carolina. It's an impressive facility, by the way. That's a Dreamliner in the back. They, had, they can fit eight of these things in their manufacturing facility. Think how big they are. Uh, so it's such a huge product, uh, manufacturing facility. And they, of course, they have even a bigger one in Everett, uh, Washington. The US Frontier of Engineering program brings together 60 young, young being defined as 45 years or younger, uh, uh, people from industry and academia and government labs to talk about cutting edge work, frontier work, and, and they are really, I've been to three of these in the last year, and they do really address new things. It's inspiring to be there. About 40% 40, uh, 40 of the participants here are women, and a, a great number are also uh, underrepresented minorities. So it helps us in our diversification of, uh, uh, of uh, the academy. Now, we also have five other frontiers of engineering programs with, with other countries. You can see what, what they are here uh, with uh, Germany and Japan, 
the um, India, uh, China, and uh, the European Union. I was just at the European Union FOE in uh, Stockholm. And in these, in these conferences, there were 60 participants, but 30 come from overseas and 30 come from the United States. Uh, these are wonderful organizations, but uh, I think a lot of innovation will come from these kinds of things. And we will, I think we should, the, the National Academy sh should uh, promote these a bit more than we do. By the way, the people are chosen from nominations, from persons like yourself, Academy members. So uh, about uh, one in five is selected, so it's an honor to be selected as a participant in a, in a frontier of engineering activity. So I'm encouraging you to nominate people, and I, uh, especially uh, some of the people we saw today in the protege program. In fact, 120 of the current members of the National Academy of Engineering participated in the Frontiers of Engineering. The first one, as I said, was held in 1995, and one of its speakers was Francis Arnold, who won the Nobel Prize this past year. Okay, we also have the Global Grand Challenges for Engineering, and I think that a lot of innovation comes this. I don't think we've leveraged this as much as we can, but if you look at this, I'd say about five, four or five of these relate to climate change, four or five relate to health biomedical systems. And I think we need to, to leverage these things and, uh, in ways that we can encourage uh, cooperation between industry and academe. Uh, the Grand Challenges uh, Scholars Program has emanated from this as well. And uh, I know some schools in Texas are uh, involved in that. Now, one of the more interesting things about this challenge is, is someone picked this up, uh, a former employee at the, uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I had to switch slides. The, this, um, this is the Grand Challenge of Scholars Program. There are, it was initiated in 2009. There are currently 80 certificate programs and another 60 schools that do something in this area. It's international, and there are summits every two years in the U.S., United Kingdom and China. The last one was in London uh, in, sep in uh, j September. Um, what's interesting about these international ones is that we get international teams of students, and it's really wonderful to see them get together and work on a project and solve a pro uh, look on a design project or something at the conference itself. There are five competencies to be to be a uh, to have a, a grand challenge a scholars program. You must have show five competencies: talent, which means a project. Uh, system, multidisciplinary systems, business and entrepreneurship, multicultural awareness, and social awareness. Now, a good example of this uh, it came, for the, uh, it came from a person named Schumacher who used to work at JPL, and he's built a carbon-free farm. He, he retired from JPL, was an engineer, and everything in this farm is made from solar power including ammonia, which he uses the Haber-Bosch process on a small scale in there to combine nitrogen and hydrogen to make ammonia, which he uses for fertilizer and for fuel in his tractor, along with electrolysis of water to make hydrogen that he drives his tractor with. So this is really an interesting article. If you have a chance to get an IEEE spectrum, what this, this person has done, and I think it's an example of innovation being driven by some ideas of, in this case, uh, climate, wor worry about climate change. Um, systems is another way we can look at it, and there's a, there's a focus on systems at the National Academy of Engineering, climate being one, health and well-being, and so on. You can read this list. And education as well, innovation in the way we educate, and we're trying to uh, support universities that are doing this. Another way of uh, uh, being relevant to innovation is through Engineer Girl. This is a website developed some 20 years ago to, uh, uh, to uh, attract girls sixth to eighth grade into STEM fields, especially engineering. And now we're pushing it to sixth grade to 12th grade in here. And all these projects require philanthropy and we've been lucky to get uh, support for Engineer Girl. It's a wonderful website and I encourage you to, to look at it. All right. Now, 
I have a, a, some final thoughts here uh, about, uh, uh, about innovation and uh, quotes. I like quotes. And uh, the first one is, um, if you're comfortable, you're not going fast enough. Anybody know who that said that? You can hear it. Mario Andretti. <laughs> and that's true. You know, it's nice to be comfortable, but our jobs as leaders is to make people uncomfortable, make sure they have to go, and innovation is a key, a key goal for that. Another thought, and this came up today in a previous talk about fracking and whatever, that you had to take the first step. And the, so change was realized by men and women who took the next step, not those who theorize about the 200th step. This is by Winston Churchill, who has a lot of good quotes. And a third one, a lot of people think they know who said this. Not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. I put this in here because in innovation, like research, it's sometimes it's difficult to develop metrics. How innovative are we? We count patents, count publications, and so on, but uh, count investment, how, what fraction of GDP we invest. But I think innovation is much more than that. And uh, so uh, some, a lot of people think Albert Einstein said this, but apparently he didn't. The man that that's attributed, this is attributed to that I could find uh, is William Bruce Cameron, who was a sociologist in 1963. This was uh, his quote. So, um, in my final thoughts, I'll mention that we do have an organization that tries to bring together university, industry, uh, uh, collaboration, and research, and it's called GWIR, Government University Industry Research Roundtable, and I think some schools here are members of GWIR. It meets a couple times a year in the National Academies building and people sharing ideas and looking at topics, doing much what you're doing here. It's kind of like Tamas in a sense uh, there. Uh, one comment I make and it came up in an earlier talk is unintended consequences. We do have to be a little bit careful about unintended consequences. You can't always foresee things. Uh, when we replaced ammonia in refrigerators by Freon, CFC, we thought we were doing a good thing because it was healthier for humans, and then we find out that the CFCs create the ozone hole. So there are consequences out that are hard to say, but we should always ask ourselves as engineers, this is part of the ethics of engineering and science as well, and medicine, uh, is uh, can we foresee any unintended consequences? And uh, second point is, Today, and a question came up about MD Anderson about uh, openness of research and research being, say, stolen or moved or whatever overseas, and how can we keep an open research collaborative environment which leads to better innovation and still protect, to some extent, what we have in this country, the taxpayer's investment in our research. Uh, there. And this is going on, it's uh, a lot of discussions at the uh, Department of Defense, uh, the FBI, the, national, the three national academies are very involved in this, the National Science Board, and so on. So we don't want to hurt innovation, uh, but we do have to protect some, some of our own uh, taxpayer-invested uh, intellectual property. And finally, we need to respect the culture of, of change. And uh, this is a job that I think we can do, that I can help with as, and, uh, as the president of National Academy of Engineering in talking about, about uh, innovation. I was told that um, by a person that you should always finish a talk in Texas with a story that's somewhat humorous. And, uh, and if you can work Oklahoma into it, it's even better. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I had a little trouble with this, but I finally came up with an older one I had heard. Uh, and it's about an Oklahoma school teacher and his wife who uh, were very upset with their teenage sons who were disrespectful. Now, that shouldn't surprise anybody that's had teenage sons, that these kids were, were disrespectful. And uh, they, were, they were both thinking, how can we, we, you know, how can we correct this behavior? They were using four-letter words, bad language is basically the problem. So to, to get these kids not to stop using four-letter words, they, they had a strategy. And, they, ha and they, were, they had a lesson plan, and they, this is how it goes. Morning for breakfast, the two parents are downstairs. 
and they call the kids to the breakfast table. And they come down the stairs in the usual disrespectful fashion, hats on backwards, sitting at the table, not saying hello or anything. So the father says to, uh, to the one son, he says, uh, Jimmy, what would you like for breakfast? And Jimmy says, ah, give me some of those damn cornflakes. Well, the father, has, he, has a, he has a teaching objective in mind. So, you know, to, he w slaps the kid across the face, knocks him off the chair. Kid's, uh, Jimmy's down on the floor. He says, Jimmy, don't ever use language like that. I don't want to hear those words again. And then the other son, Johnny, is sitting at the table, and he's kind of scared. And father says, OK, Johnny, I think you've learned the lesson. What would you like for breakfast? And Johnny barely speaks up and says, I'm not sure, Dad, but you can bet your sweet ass it ain't cornflakes. <laughs> so be careful when you've got teaching objectives and you have goals. Make sure you know what you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your talk, John. I, um I'm probably a member of, of National Academy of Engineering, so I thank you. Now, I spent a big part of my life on representation, okay, and, and um, I'm a university professor. So I want to go back to underrepresented minority. To me, underrepresented minority must be domestic born and raised. We want to see how this country is doing with respect to educating minorities. So I take, and if you say you're 7%, okay, I challenge NAE to see, if you look at how many of those are domestic, born, and raised, I'll bet you it's less than 1%, less than 1%. And so that's an issue with me, is using it that way, because people don't, they define underrepresented minority in very loose ways. And to me, it's what is this country doing with respect to us? So I'd like to know, and maybe I'll, I'll follow up, what is the percentage? NAE of domestic born minorities. I conjecture less than one. Thank you. Well, I'm not a betting man. Uh, I'm not sure you're right. I, don't, I can't answer the question because I haven't looked at that. I look at US citizens as US citizens. Once you're a citizen of this country, you're, you're part of us. Um, I see your point about investment in people uh, and education. I certainly understand that. Uh, but I still think that uh, people from different backgrounds uh, can, can provide uh, uh, perspectives that not all of us have. I it's, also, it's, also a question, yeah. it's also a question of talent pool because we need to draw on all the talent of, uh, uh, of our citizens. So I'm looking at it as a citizenship issue, and I don't really get into whether or not they were born here or born elsewhere. I will certainly take a look at that, and uh, if I can give me your name, I'll get back to you. But I'm not sure how relevant it is, to be honest with you. Thank you.